we collectively acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Duluth is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on land that was called home and cared for by the Ojibwe people, before them the Dakota and Northern Cheyenne people, and other native peoples from time immemorial. Seated by the Ojibwe in an 1854 treaty, this land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance for its original stewards, the native nations, and peoples of this region. We recognize and continually support and advocate for the tribal sovereignty of the native nations in this territory and beyond. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm tribal sovereignty and will work to hold the University of Minnesota Duluth accountable to American Indian peoples and nations. Welcome to the Marshall Performing Arts Center and this special outdoor production of the life of King Henry V. On behalf of UMD Theater, we would like to remind you that even though we're outside this evening, it is necessary to wear your face mask coverings at all times and maintain social distance. Just as the actors will be doing. Please take this moment to turn off cell phones and other electronic devices. And in consideration of audience members around you, please refrain from texting during the performance. UMD Theater would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, TCF Bank. Henry V will be performed without intermission, so sit back in the lawn chair or blanket of your choice and enjoy the show. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But, pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon. Since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us, ciphers to this great account, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high, uprearid, and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think, when we talk of horses, that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping o'er times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the wood supply, admit me chorus to this history, who, prologue-like, your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. My good lord, that self bill is urged, which in the eleventh year of the last king's reign was like, and had indeed against us passed. But how, my lord, shall we resist it now? It must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. But what prevention? The king is full of grace and fair regard is a true lover of the Holy Church. But, my good Lord, how now for mitigation of this bill urged by the commons? Doth his majesty incline to it or no? He seems indifferent, or rather swaying more upon our part, for I have made an offer to his majesty as touching France. And how did this offer seem received? With good acceptance? And the hour, I think, is come to give him hearing. I'll wait upon you, and I long to hear it. Where is my gracious lord of Canterbury? Not here in presence. Send for him, good uncle. For the ambassador, my liege. Not yet, my cousin. We would be resolved before we hear him of some things of weight that task our thoughts concerning us and France. God and his angels guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. Sure, we thank you. My learned lord, we pray you to proceed and religiously and justly unfold why the law Salic that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. 
And pray take heed how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you in God's name, take heed. For never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood. Then hear me, gracious sovereign. There is no bar to make against your highness claim to France but this, which they did produce from Pharamond. In terum salicum malaris nesuccident. No woman shall succeed in Salic land. Which Salic land the French unjustly glows to be the realm of France? Yet their own authors faithfully affirm that the land Salic is in Germany, between the floods of Sela and of Elbe. Then doth it well appear that Salic law was not devised for the French, nor did the French possess the Salic law until 401 and 20 years after the function of King Pharamond. King Pepin, which deposed Childric, did as heir general, being descended of Blythild, which was daughter to King Clotar, make claim and title to the crown of France. King Capet, also, who usurped the crown of Charles, the Duke of Lorraine, sole heir male of the true line and stock of Charles the Great, could not keep quiet in his conscience, wearing the crown of France, till satisfied that fair Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was lineal of Lady Ermengar, daughter to Charles, the foresaid Duke of Lorraine, by the which marriage the line of Charles the Great was reunited to the crown of France. So it is clear as is the summer sun. All appear to hold in right and title to the female. So do the kings of France unto this day. May I with right and conscience make this claim? The sin upon my head, dread sovereign. Stand for your own. Unwind your bloody flag! Awake, remembrance of these valiant dead, and with your puissant arms renew their feats! Your brother, kings and monarchs of this earth, do all expect that you should rouse yourself, as did the former lions of your blood. Never king of England hath nobles richer and more loyal subjects! And let their bodies follow, my dear liege, with blood and sword and fire to win your right. Therefore to France, my liege, to France. Call in the messenger sent from the Dauphin. Now are we well resolved, and by God's help, France being ours, we'll bend it to our awe, or break it all to pieces. Now, are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin? For we hear your greeting is from him, not from the king. Therefore, with frank and uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Your Highness, lately sending into France did claim some certain dukedoms. In answer which claim the prince, my master, says that you savor too much of your youth. He therefore sends you, meter for your spirit, this ton of treasure. And in lieu of, this, in lieu of this, desires you like the dukedoms that you claim, hear no more of you. This the dolphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the dolphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains, we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set. Shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. But tell the Dauphin I will keep my state. Be like a king and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. And tell the pleasant prince this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones. And many a thousand widows shall this his mock mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down. And some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. So get you hence in peace, and tell the Dauphin his jest will savor but of shallow wit when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Fare you well. <laughs> This was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition. For we now have no thought in us but France. Therefore, let every man now task his thoughts that this fair action may on foot be brought. Now all the youth of England are on fire. <laughs> For now sits expectation in the air and hides a sword from hilts unto the point with 
crowns imperial, crowns and cornets promised to Harry and his followers. The French, advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear and with pale policy seek to divert the English purposes. France hath found a nest of hollow bosoms and three corrupted men. One, Richard Earl of Cambridge, and the second, Henry Lord Scroop of Massam, and the third, Sir Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland, have for the guilt of France, oh guilt indeed, confirmed conspiracy with fearful France, and by their hands this grace of kings must die ere he take ship for France. The traitors are agreed. The king is set from London, and now unto Southampton do we shift our scene. Well met, Corporal Neil. Oh, good morrow, Lieutenant Bardolph. What? Are you an ancient pistol friends yet? Eh, for my part, I care not. I say little. Come, I will bestow a breakfast and make you two friends. We'll be all three sworn brothers to France. Let it be so good, Corporal Nim. I will do. As I may. Now, it is certain that he is married to Nell quickly, and certainly she did you wrong, for you were betrothed to her. <laughs> How now, mine host pistol? Base tyke, call'st thou me host? Now, by this hand, I swear I scorned the term. Nay. Oh, piss for thee, Iceland dog. Thou prick-eared cur of Iceland. <laughs> Good Corporal Nim, show thy valor and put up your sword. Will you shog off? The pistol, I will scour you with my high rapier, and that's the humor of it. Oh, braggart vile! The grave doth gape, and doting death is near. Hear me what I say, he that strikes the first stroke I'll run him up to the hilts, as I am a soldier. An oath of mickle might, and fury shall abate. I will cut thy throat, one time or other. Come, shall I make you two friends? We must to France together. Why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? You'll pay me the eight shillings I want of you at betting? The base is the slave that pays. By this sword, he that makes the first thrust, I'll kill him! By this sword, I will! Sword is an oath, and oaths must have their course! <laughs> Prithee, honey sweet husband, bristle thy courage up, Bardolf, be blithe, Nim, rouse thy vaunting veins. For Sir John Falstaff, he is dead, and we must yearn therefore. Would I were with him, where some he is, either in heaven or in hell. Nay, sure he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom. If ever man went to Arthur's bosom, he made a finer end and went away than any Christom child. He parted even just between twelve and one, even at the turning of the tide. He babbled of green fields. How now, Sir John, pull by, be of good cheer. He cried out, God, God, God! Here, four times? Now I, to comfort him, bid him he should not think of God. I hope there is no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. I put my hand into the bed and felt them, and they were as cold as any stone. I fell to his knees, and they were as cold as any stone. And so, upward and upward, and all was as cold as any stone. <laughs> They say he cried out of sack. Aye, that he did. And of women. Nay, that he did not. Yes, that he did, and said there were the devils incarnate. He can never abide carnation. It was a color he never liked. I shall have the eight shillings I want of you at betting. A noble shalt thou have, and present pay. And liquor likewise shall I give to thee, and friendship will combine, and brotherhood. I'll live by Nim, and Nim shall live by me. 
Give me thy hand. I shall have my noble. In cash most justly paid. Well then! <laughs> That's the humor of it! Uh, shall we shog? The king will be gone from Southampton. Come! Let's away to France. Like horse leeches, my boys, to suck! To suck! The very blood! Uh, to suck. To suck! Okay. Farewell, hostess. Keep close, I thee command! Farewell! Adieu! Now sits the wind fair, and we will aboard. My lord of Cambridge, my kind lord of Massam, and you, gentle knight, give me your thoughts. Think you not that the powers we bear with us will cut their passage through the force of France? No doubt, my liege, if each man do his best. I doubt not that. <laughs> Never was monarch better feared and loved than is your majesty. True. We therefore have great cause of thankfulness. Uncle of Exeter, set free the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excessive wine that set him on, and on his more advice, we pardon him. That's mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breed, by his sufferance, more of such a kind. Oh, let us yet be merciful. So may your highness, and yet punish, too. You shall great mercy, if you give him life, after the taste of much correction. Alas, your too much love and care of me are heavy orisons against this poor wretch. If little faults proceeding on distemper shall not be winked at, how shall we stretch our eye when capital crimes, chewed, swallowed, and digested, appear before us? And now to our French causes. Who are the late commissioners? I won, my lord. Your highness bade me ask for it today. So did you me, my liege. And I, my royal sovereign. Then Richard, Earl of Cambridge, there is yours. They're yours, Lord Scoop of Massam, and Sir Knight, Grey of Northumberland, the same as yours. Read them, and know I know your worthiness. <sighs> Why, how now, gentlemen? What see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? I do confess my fault and do submit me to your highness' mercy. To which we all appeal. Now, the mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy. For your own reasons, turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters. See you, my princes and noble peers, these English monsters. What shall I say to thee, Lord Scroop? Thou cruel, ingrateful, savage, and inhuman creature. Thou that didst bear the key of all my counsels, that knewest the very bottom of my soul. So constant and unspotted didst thou seem. I will weep for thee, for this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another fall of man. I arrest thee of high treason, by the name of Richard, Earl of Cambridge. I arrest thee of high treason, by the name of Henry, Lord Scroop of Massam. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. Hear your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaim, and from his coffers received the golden earnest of our death, wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter and his whole kingdom into desolation. Get you therefore hence, poor, miserable wretches, to your death, bear them hence. Now, lords, for France, the enterprise whereof shall be to you as us, like glorious. Since God so graciously hath brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way, cheerly to see the signs of war advance. No king of England, if not king of France. Thus comes the English with full power upon us. And more than carefully it us concerns to answer royally in our defenses. Therefore the Dukes of Berry, and of Britannia, and you, Prince Dauphin, 
Shall make four. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe, and let us do it with no show of fear. For, my good liege, England is so idly kinged by a vain, giddy, shallow, <laughs> humorous youth that fear oh, attends her peace, not. peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too much mistaken in this king. Question, your grace, the late ambassador, with what great state he heard their embassy. How well supplied with noble counselors, how modest in exception, and withal, how terrible in constant resolution. Well, tis not so, my lord high constable, but though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defense, tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. Think we, King Harry Strong. And princes, look you strongly armed to meet him, for he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our too much memorable shame when Cressy Battle fatally was struck. This is a stem of that victorious stock. And let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, do crave admittance to your majesty. We will give them present audience. Go and bring them. You see this chase is hotly followed, friends. Good, my sovereign. Take up the English short and let them know of what a monarchy you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother England? From him, and thus he greets your majesty. He wills you, in the name of God Almighty, that you divest yourself, and lay apart the borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, belong to him and his heirs, namely the crown. <laughs> Willing you overlook this pedigree, and when you find him most evenly derived of his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward III, he bids you then resign your crown and kingdom, held against him the native and true challenger. Or else what follows? Bloody constraint. <laughs> for if you hide the crown, even in your hearts there will he rake for it. <laughs> Therefore in a fierce tempest he is coming. In thunder and an earthquake. He will compel. <laughs> this is his claim, his threatening in my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting to. For the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty sender doth he prize you at. Thus says my king. Say, if my father render fair return from England, it is against my will. For I desire nothing but odds with England. And to that end, matching to his youth and vanity, I did present him with the Paris He'll balls. make your Paris Louvre shake for it. And be assured, you'll know this the difference, as we his subjects have in wonder found the difference between his greener days and those he masters now. <laughs> Tomorrow shall you know our mind at full. Dispatch us with all speed lest that my king come here to question our delay, for he is footed in this land already. Thus with imagined wing, our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty and his brave fleet with silken streamers, the young Phoebus Fanning. Play with your fancies, and in them behold upon the hempen tackle ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the huge bottoms breasting the lofty surge. Oh, do but think you stand upon the rivage and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing, for so appears his fleet majestical, holding due course to Harfleur. Follow. Follow, grapple your minds to sternage of this navy, and leave your England as dead midnight still, guarded with grandsires, babies, and old women, either past or not arrived to pith and puissance. For who is he whose chin is button riched with one appearing hair that will not follow these cold and choice drawn cavaliers to France? Work, work your thoughts, and therein see a siege. Behold the ordnance on their carriages with fatal mouths gaping on girded harfleur. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry that the king doth offer him Catherine, 
his daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not. And the nimble gunner with Linstock now the devilish cannon touches. And down goes all before them. Still, be kind and eke out our performance with your mind. Once more to the breach, dear friends! Once more, close the wall up with our English dead! In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Then, lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let pride through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock or hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now, set the teeth, stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, your noblest English. Now, attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eye. Oh, I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry God for Harry, England, and St. George! On! 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 To the breach! To the breach! Baby, bro! Stay? Hey, the knocks are too hot, and for my own part I have not a case of lives. Hey, knocks go and come. God's vassals drop and die, and, and sword so and me. shield and blood a field doth win immortal fame. Hey, 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 hey. When I were were in an alehouse in London, I would give up all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. Ah! How yet resolves the governor of the town? This is the latest parl we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves. Or, like to men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier, if I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved Harfleur till in her ashes she lie buried. I in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill, shrieking daughters. Your fathers, taken by the silver beards and their most reverent heads, dashed to the walls. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes, whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds. What say you? Will you yield in this avoid? Or guilty in the fence be thus destroyed? The Dauphin returns us that his powers are yet not ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, dread king, enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Come, Uncle Exeter, go you and enter Harfleur. There remain and fortify it strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. Tonight in our floor we will be your guest. Tomorrow for the march are we addressed. Alice, tu as été en Angleterre et tu parles bien la langue? Un peu, madame. Je te prie, monsieur, il faut que je prenne Paris. Comment appelez-vous le mât? Oh, anglais, what? Uh, la main. Elle est appelée de hand. De hand. Oui. Et les doigts? Oh, les doigts. Oh, ma foi, j'oublie les doigts, mais, mais je me souviendrai les doigts. Uh, je pense qu'ils sont appelés de fingres. Oui, oui, de fingres. La main de hand, les doigts de fingers. Fingers, oui. Je pense que je suis libre au courrier. Je connais votre anglais, vite, moi. <laughs> 
Comment t'appelles-vous les ongles? Ou les ongles, nous les appelons de nice, madame. De nice. Mm. Écoutez, si dites-moi si je parle bien de hand, de fingers et de nice. De nice. Ah, oh, c'est bien dit, madame, elle est fort pour l'anglois. Dites-moi l'anglois pour le bras. De arm, oh, madame. Et le coude? De elbow. De elbow. Mm -hmm. Je me fais la réputation de tout le monde que vous m'avez appris dès à présent. Oh, il est trop difficile, madame, comme je pense. Excusez-moi, Alice, écoutez. De hand, de fangers, de nails, de arm, de bilbo. Uh, de elbow, madame. Oh, signe de je m'oublie de elbow. Oh. <rire> Comment appelez-vous le col? Uh, oh, de neck, madame. De neck. Oui. Et le menton? De chin. Du tin. Oui. Le col du nick, du menton, du tin. Ah, oui, ce patronat en vérité. Vous prononcez le mot si toi que le natif d'Angleterre. Je n'ai d'autre pour ne pas le pour le reste de tout et au pour de tout. Oh, N'avez-vous pas déjà ce que je vous sais en fait? Non, je ressentirai à vos propres mots. D'accord. De hand, de fingers, de miles. Euh, de niles, madame. N niles. Niles, oui. De or, du ilbo. Oh, c'est votre nom de Elbow. On se dit, j'ai de Elbow. Oui. De Nick et de Tien. Oh. Comment appelez-vous le pied et le haut? Uh, uh, <coughs> des foot, madame. Et des coon. De... <coughs> des foot et des coon. Oh, c'est bien doux, c'est ce mot, c'est mauvais, comme tu vas pas, c'est un peu dick. Et ne parle pas de nez, je ne voudrais pas nous dire devant le sien, je pense pour tout le monde. De foutre de coup. Ouh, madame. Mais moi, je crois que c'est une autre femme, elles sont ensemble. De hand, de fingers, de nails, de arm, de elbow. Elbow. De nick, de teen, de foutre, de coup. Oh, <rire> excellent, madame. C'est tout pour une fois. Allons nous adigner. D'accord. Thus comes the Eng... Er, Tis certain he hath passed the river Somme. And if he be not fought with all, my lord, let us not live in France. Normans. B bastard Normans. Norman bastards! Where have they this metal? Is not their climate foggy, raw, and dull? Oh, for honor of our land! By faith and honor, our madams mock at us, and plainly say our metal is bred out, and they will give their bodies to the lust of the English youth from New Store France with battle warriors. Where is Montjoy the Herald? Speed him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Up! Princes, and with spirits of honor edged more sharper than your swords, high to the fields. Bar Harry England that sweeps through our land with pennons painted in the blood of Harfleur. Go down upon him. You have power enough. And in a captive chariot into Rowan, bring him our prisoner. This becomes the great. Sorry am I, his numbers are so few. His Soldiers sick and famished in their march. For I'm sure when he shall see our army, he'll drop his heart into the sink of fear. And for achievement, offer us his ransom. Therefore, Lord Constable, haste on Montjoy. And let him say to England, we stand to know what willing ransom he will give. Prince Dauphin, you shall stay with us in Rowan. Well, not so, I do beseech your majesty. Be patient. <sighs> For you shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable, and princes all, and quickly bring us word of England's fall. How now, Captain Fluellen, coming from the bridge, is the Duke of Exeter safe? He is not. Oh. Any hurts in the world but keeps the bridge most valiantly with excellent discipline. Captain, I do beseech to do me favors. The Duke of Exeter doth love thee well. I, I praise God, and I have merited some love at his hands. Bardolph, a, a soldier firm and sound of heart and of buxom valor, hath by cruel fate and Giddy fortune's furious fickle wheel managed. By your patience, ancient pistol, fortune is an excellent moral. Fortune is Bardolph's foe. 
and frowns on him, uh, for he hath stolen a pax, and hanged must be. Uh, therefore go speak, the duke will hear thy voice. Ancient pistol, I do partly understand your meaning. Oh, why then rejoice, therefore? <laughs> it is not a thing to rejoice at, for if, look you, he were my brother, I would desire the duke to use his good pleasure and put him to execution, <gasps> for discipline ought to be used. Die and be damned! <laughs> and figo for thy friendship. <laughs> How now, Flewellyn? Camest thou from the bridge? Aye, so please your majesty, the Duke of Exeter hath very gallantly maintained the bridge. What men have you lost? I think the Duke hath lost never a man but one that is like to be executed for robbing a church. One Bardolph, if your majesty know the man. We would have all such offenders so cut off and we give express charge that in our marches through the country there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, none of the French abraded or abused in disdainful language. For when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. What shall I know of thee? My master's mind. Unfold it. Thus says my king. Say thou to Harry of England, though we seem dead, we did but sleep. Tell him we could have rebuked him at our floor, but we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly. Bid him therefore consider of his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, which in wait to re-answer. His pettiness would bow under. To this add defiance, and tell him, for conclusion, he hath betrayed his followers whose condemnation is pronounced. So far, my king and master, so much my office. What is thy name? I know thy quality. Montjoy. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back and tell the king I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment. Go therefore, tell thy master here I am. My ransom is this frail and worthless trunk, my army but a weak and sickly guard. Yet God before tell him we will come on, though France himself and such another neighbor stand in our way. So Montjoy, fare you well. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are we say we will not shun it. So tell the master. I shall deliver so. Thanks to your highness. I hope they will not come upon us now. We are in God's hand, brother, not in theirs. March to the bridge. It now draws toward night. Beyond the river, we'll encamp ourselves, and on tomorrow, bid them march away. I have the best armor of the world. Would it were dead? Uh, you have an excellent armor, but let my horse have his due. It is the best horse of Europe. Uh, will it ne'er be morning? My lord of Orleans, and my lord high constable, you talk of horse and armor. Uh, you are as well provided of both as any prince. In I will the world. not change my horse with any that treads but on four hooves. When I bestride him, I soar. I am a hawk. He is pure air and fire, and the dull elements of earth and water never appear in him, but only in patient stillness while his rider mounts him. Indeed, my lord, it is a most absolute and excellent horse. My lord constable, the armor that I saw in your tent tonight, were those stars or suns upon it? The stars, Montjoy. The sum of which will fall tomorrow, I hope. And yet my sky shall not want? <laughs> tomorrow I will trot a mile and my way shall be paved in English faces. Well, I should not say so, for fear I should be faced out of my way. I'll go arm myself. <laughs> <laughs> the dolphin longs for morning. He longs to eat the English. I think he will eat all he kills. Uh, he never did harm that I heard of. Nor will do none tomorrow. <laughs> Alas, poor Harry of England. 
He longs not for the dawning as we do. If the English had any apprehension, they would run away. But that island of England breeds very valiant creatures. Now is it time to arm. Come, shall we about it? It is now two o'clock, but let me see. By ten, we shall have each a hundred Englishmen. Now entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds that the thick sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire, and through their paley flames, each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed, and high and boastful nace, piercing the knight's dull ear. And from the tents, the armorers accomplishing the knights with busy hammers, closing rivets up, give dreadful note of preparation. The country cocks do crow, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and overlusty French to the low-rated English play at dice and chide the crippled, tardy-gated knight who, like a foul witch, doth limp so tediously away. Poor, condemned English, like sacrifices by their watchful fires, sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger and their gesture sad, investing lankling cheeks and war-worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon so many horrid ghosts. Oh now, who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of color unto the weary, all-watched knight, but freshly looks and overbears a taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty, that every wretch, pining and pale before beholding him, plucks comfort from his looks. A largest universal like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to everyone, thawing cold fear that mean and gentle all behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of hairy in the night. And so our scene must to the battle fly, where Oh, for pity, we shall much disgrace with four or five most vile and ragged foils, right ill-disposed and brawl ridiculous, the name of Agincourt. Yet, sit and see, mining true things by what their mockeries be. Gloucester, tis true that we are in great danger. The greater, therefore, should our courage be. Good morrow, old Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good soft pillow for that good white head were better than a churlish turf of France. Not so, my liege, this lodging likes me better, since I may say now lie I like a king. Tis good for men to love their present pains upon example, so the spirit is eased. Lend me thy cloak, Sir Thomas. Brothers both, commend me to the princes in our camp. Do my good morrow to them, and anon desire them all to my pavilion. We shall, my liege. Shall I attend your grace? No, my good lord. Go with my lords to my brothers of England. I and my bosom must debate a while, and then I would know other company. The Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Harry. God of mercy, old heart. Thou speaks cheerfully. A friend. Art thou officer or art thou base? I am a gentleman of a company. What are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. Oh, then you are a better than the king. 
with the kings of Barcock and a heart of gold. A lad of life and imp of fame, of parents good, of fist most valiant. <laughs> I kiss his dirty shoe. And from heartstring, I love the lovely bully. <laughs> what is thy name? Harry. Leroy. Uh, Leroy! <laughs> A Cornish name. No, I am a Welshman. Knowst thou Flewellen? Yes. <laughs> Tell him I'll knock his leak about his pate. Upon St. Davy's Day. Oh, do not wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest he knock that about yours. Oh, art thou his friend? And kinsman, too. <laughs> the figo for thee, then. I thank you. <laughs> God be with you. My name is Pistol Cold. That sorts well with your fierceness. Captain Flewellen. Shh! In the name of Jesu Christ, speak lower! If you would take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no tittle-tuttle nor pibble puddle in Pompey's camp. Why? The enemy is loud. You can hear him all night. If the enemy is an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb, is it me, think you, that we should also be an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb? I will speak lower. I pray and beseech you that you will. Brother John Vates. Is not that the morning which breaks yonder? Well, I think it be. But we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. <laughs> we see yonder the beginning of the day, but I think we may never see the end of it. <sighs> Who goes there? A, a friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Erpingham. <sighs> a good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even as men wrecked upon a sand that looked to be washed off the next tide. He hath not told his thoughts to the king? No, nor does not meet he should. I think the king is but a man as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me. Mm -hmm. His ceremonies laid by, in his nakedness he appears but a man. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears, as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe, as cold a night as tis, that he could wish himself in Thames up to the neck. And so I would he were, and I by him at all adventures, so we were quit here. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Then I would he were here alone. <laughs> he thinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company. His cause being just, his quarrel honorable. That's more than we know. Aye, or more than we should seek after, for we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if his cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. When all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in battle, so join together at the latter day and cry all we died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind them, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children Raleigh left. I am afeard there are few die well that die in a battle, for how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it. So, if a son that is by his father sent about merchandise do sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness, by your rule, should be imposed upon his father that sent him. But this is not so. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, nor the father of his sons. For they purpose not their deaths when they purpose their services. Besides, there is no king, be his cause never so spotless, can try it out with all unspotted soldiers. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul's his own. Tis certain, 
Every man that dies ill, the ill upon his own head, the king is not to answer it. I, I do not desire he should answer for me, and yet I determined to fight lustily for him. Yeah, I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. Oh. Aye, he said so to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, and we ne'er the wiser. If I ever live to see it, I will never trust his word after. You pay him then. He'll never trust his word after. Come, tis a foolish say. Your reproof is something too round. I should be angry with you if time were convenient. Let it be a quarrel between us, if you live. Oh, I embrace it. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gauge of thine. I will wear it my bonnet. Then, if you ever dare to acknowledge it, I will challenge it. <laughs> Here's my glove. Give me another of thine. Oh. <laughs> there. <laughs> this will I also wear in my cap. If ever thou come to me and say, after tomorrow, this is my glove, by this hand I will take thee a box on the ear. If I ever live to see it, I'll never trust his word after. <laughs> Keep thy word. Fare thee well. Oh my, be friends, you English fools. Be friends. We have French quarrels enough. Upon the king, let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. Oh, hard condition. Twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool. What infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And what have kings that privates have not to, save ceremony? And what art thou, thou idle ceremony? What drinks thou oft, instead of homage sweet, but Poisoned flattery, ugh! Be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Canst thou, when thou commandst the beggar's knee, command the health of it? No. Thou proud dream that placed so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the balm the scepter and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the inner-tissued robe of gold and pearl, the farced title running for the king, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremonies. Not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave who with a full body and vacant mind gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread. Never sees horrid night, the child of hell, but like a lackey, from the rise to set, sweats in the eye of Phoebus, and all night sleeps in Elysium. Next day after dawn doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse, and follow so the ever-running year with profitable labor to his grave. And but for ceremony, such a wretch, winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand advantage of a king. My lord, your nobles jealous of your absence seek through your camp to find you. Good old knight, collect them all together at my tent. I'll be before thee. I shall do it, my lord. Oh, god of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning if the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. Not today, God, oh, not today. Think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. I, Richard's body, have interred anew, and on it have bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forced drops of blood. Five hundred poor I have in yearly pay, who twice a day their withered hands hold up toward heaven to pardon blood. And I have built two chantries where the sad and solemn priests sing still for Richard's soul. More will I do, though all I can do is nothing worth, since that my penitence comes after all imploring pardon. My I know thy errand. I will go with thee. The day, my friends, and all things stay for me. The sun has killed our armor. Up, 
Mount, my lord. Mark our seat for present service day. Mount them and make incision in their hides that their hot blood may spin in English eyes. Do but behold yon poor and starved band. For your fair show shall suck away their souls, leaving them but the shales and husks of men. There is not work enough for all our hands. A very little, little let us do, and all is done. Then let the trumpets sound, for our approach shall so much dare the field that England shall couch down in fear and yield. Why do you stay so long, my lords of France? Yon island carriots, desperate of their bones, ill-favoredly become the morning field. They have said their prayers, and they stay for death. Come, come away. The sun is high, and we outwear the day. Where is the king? The king himself is rode to view their battle. The fighting men, they have full three score thousand. There's five to one. Besides, they're all fresh. Tis a fearful odds. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmerland. No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will. I pray thee wish not one man more. Rather proclaim it, Westmerland, for my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall outlive this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, it all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford, Exeter, Warwick, Talbot, Salisbury, Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son. And crisp and crispy and shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now a bed shall think themselves a curse they were not here. And all their manhood's cheap, whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. My sovereign lord, bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedience charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Perish the man whose mind is backward now. Oh, thou dost not wish more help from England, cuz? God's will. My liege, would you and I alone, without more help, could fight this royal battle? Why, now thou hast unwished five thousand men which likes me better than to wish us one. You know your places. God be with you all. Once more I come to know of thee, King Harry, if for thy ransom thou wilt now compound before thy most assured overthrow. Who hath sent thee now? The Constable of France. I pray thee, bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me and then sell my bones. Good God! Why should they mock poor fellows thus? Let me speak proudly. Tell the constable we are but warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful field. But by the mass, our hearts are in the trim. Comest thou no more for ransom, gentle herald? For they shall have none, I swear, but these my joints, which if they will have as I will yield them then, shall yield them little. So tell the constable. I shall, King Harry. So fare thee well. Thou never shalt hear herald any more. My lord, most humbly on my knee I beg the leading of the Valward. Take it, brave York. Now, soldiers, march away. And how thou pleasest, God, 
dispose the day. that we played at dice for? Is this the king we sent to for his ransom? Shame and eternal shame. Nothing but shame. Let us die in honor once more back again. We are enough yet living in the field to smother up the English in our throngs. If any order might be thought upon. The devil take order now. I'll to the throng. Let life be short, else shame will be too long. Well have we done, thrice valiant countrymen, but all's not done, yet keep the French the field. The Duke of York commends him to your majesty. Lives he, good uncle. Thrice within this hour I saw him down, thrice up again in fighting. From the helmet to the spur all blood he was. In which array, brave soldier, doth he lie, larding the play, and by his bloody side, yoke fellow to his honor owing wounds? The noble Earl of Suffolk's also lies. But hark, what new alarm is the same? Well, the French have reinforced their scattered men. Then every soldier kill his prisoners. Give the word through. Kill the poise in the luggage. Tis expressly against the laws of arms. Tis as ardent a piece of knavery. Mark you now as can be offered. Tis certain there's not a boy left alive. I was not angry since I came to France until this instant. We'll cut the throats of those we have, and not a man of them shall taste our mercy. How now? What means this, Herald? Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license, that we may wander o'er this bloody field to book our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men, for many of our princes lie drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. Well, give us leave, great king to view the field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day be ours or no. The day is yours. Praised be God and not our strength for it. What is this castle called that stands hard by? They call it Agincourt. And then call we this the field of Agincourt, fought on the day of Crispin Crispianus. Your grandfather, a famous memory, and please your majesty, your great uncle, Edward the Plaque, Prince of Wales, as I've read in the chronicles, fought a most brave battle here in France. They did, Flewellen. This is very true, your majesty. If your majesty is remembered of it, the Welshmen did good service in a garden with a leeks did grow, wearing leeks in their monmouth caps, which your majesty know, to this hour, isn't an honorable badge of service. And I do believe your majesty takes no scorn to wear the leek upon St. Davy's Day. I wear it for a memorable honor, for I am Welsh, you know, good countrymen. All the water and wine cannot wash your majesty's Welsh blood out of your body. I can tell you that, God bless it and preserve it, so long as it pleases his grace and his majesty too. Thanks. Good, my countrymen. You by Jethu, I am your majesty's countryman. I care not who know it. I will confess it to all the world. God be praised. So long as your majesty is an honest man. God keep me so. Soldier, why wearest thou that 
glove in thy cap. Oh, please, your majesty. Tis the gauge of one that I should fight withal, if he be alive. An Englishman? A rascal that swaggered with me last night. Who, if alive and never dared to challenge this glove, I've sworn to take him a box on the ear. <laughs> or if I can see my glove in his cap, which he swore, as he was a soldier, he would wear if alive, I will strike it out soundly. Well, thank you, Captain Fluellen. Is it fit this soldier keep his oath? He is a craven in a villain else, and please your majesty in my conscience. It may be his enemy is a gentleman of great sort, quite from the answer of his degree. Though he be a good a gentleman as that devil is, as Lucifer and Beelzebub himself. It is necessary, look your grace, that he keep his vow and his oath. Then keep thy vow, sirrah, when thou meetest the fellow. <laughs> so I will, my liege. As I live. Sir, know you this glove? Know the glove? I know the glove is a glove! I know this, and thus I challenge it. Good! And on in traitor is any in the universal world, or in France, or in England! I'm no traitor. That's a light in my throat! How now? What's the matter? My liege, here is a villain and a traitor that look your grace has struck the glove which your majesty has taken out of the helmet of Allenson. My liege, this was my glove. Here is the fellow of it, and he that I gave it to in change promised to wear it in his cap. I promised to strike him if he did. I met this man with my glove in his cap, and I've been as good as my word. Your majesty, here now, saving your majesty's manhood, what an ardent, rascally, Baggily, lousy knave it is! I hope your majesty will pair me witness and testimony and will of outrant that this is the glove that your majesty has given me in your conscience now! Give me that glove, soldier. Look. Here is the fellow of it. Twas I indeed thou promised to strike, and thou hast given me most bitter terms. Your majesty came not like yourself. You appeared to me but as a common man. For had you been as I took you for, I, I made no offense. Therefore, I beseech your highness, pardon me. Here. Uncle Exeter, fill this glove with crowns and give it to this fellow. Keep it, fellow, and wear it for an honor in thy cap till I do challenge it. Now, Harold, are the dead numbered? Here is the number of the slaughtered French. This note doth tell me of 10,000 French that in the field lie slain. Of princes in this number, 126. Added to these of knights, esquires, and gallant gentlemen, 8,400, of the which 500 were but yesterday dubbed knights. Here was a royal fellowship of death. Where are the number of our English dead? Edward, the Duke of York, the Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, Davy Gam, Esquire, none else of name, and of all other men but five and twenty. O oh God, thy arm was here, and not to us, but to thy arm alone ascribe we all. Tis wonderful. Come, go we in procession to the village, and be it death proclaimed to boast of this, or take the praise from God, which is his only. Is it not lawful, and please your majesty, to tell how many is killed? Yes, captain, but with this acknowledgement that God fought for us. Yes, my conscience, he did us great good. Do we all holy rites? Let there be sung non nobis and te deum, the dead with charity enclosed in clay. And then to Calais, and to England then, where ne'er from France arrived more happy men. 
No, no, pisto mine domine. No, no, pisto mine. Sed no mine, sed no mine. Tu ota gloria. No, no. Vouch safe to those that have not read the story that I may prompt them. And of such as have, I humbly pray them to admit the excuse of time, of numbers, and due course of things which cannot in their huge and proper life be here presented. Now we bear the king toward Calais. Grant him there. There seen, heave him away upon your winged thoughts athwart the sea. Behold, the English beach pales in the flood with men, with wives, and boys whose shouts and claps outvoice the deep-mouthed sea. So let him land and solemnly see him set on to London. So swift a pace hath thought that even now you may imagine him upon Blackheath, where that his lords desire him to have borne his bruised helmet and his bended sword before him through the city. He forbids it being free from vainness and self-glorious pride, giving full trophy, signal, and assent quite from himself to God. But now behold how London doth pour out her citizens, the mayor and all his brethren in best sort, like to the senators of the antique Rome with the plebeians swarming at their heels, go forth and fetch their conquering Caesar in. Now in London place him and Omit all the occurrences, whatever chance, till Harry's back return again to France. There must we place him, and myself have played the interim by remembering you tis past. Then brook abridgment and your eyes advance, after your thoughts, straight back again to France. Peace to this meeting. Unto our brother France, health and fair time of day. Unto our most fair and princely cousin Catherine, joy and good wishes. And as a branch and member of this royalty by whom this great assembly is contrived, we do salute you, Duke of Burgundy. And Prince's French and peers, health to you all. Right joyous are we to behold your face, most worthy brother England. Fairly met. Same to you, Princes English. Everyone. My duty to you both. Unequal love. Great kings of France and England, since then my office hath so far prevailed. That face to face and royal eye to eye you have congreeted. Let it not disgrace me if I demand before this royal view why that the naked, poor, and mangled peace should not in the best garden of the world, our fertile France, put up her lovely visage. Alas, she hath from France too long been chased, and all her husbandry doth lie on heaps, corrupting in its own fertility. And as our vineyards, follows, meads, and hedges, defective in their natures, grow to wildness, even so ourselves and our houses and children have lost and do not learn for want of time the sciences that should become our country, but grow like savages as soldiers will, that nothing do but meditate on blood. Do swearing and stern looks diffuse the tire and everything that seems unnatural? And my speech entreats. <laughs> that I may know the let, why gentle peace, should not expel these inconveniences and bless us with their former qualities. If, Duke of Burgundy, you would the peace, whose want gives growth to the affections which you have cited, you must buy that peace with full accord to all our just demands. I have but with a cursory eye or glanced the articles. It pleaseth your grace to appoint some of your council presently to sit with us once more. We will suddenly pass our accept and preemptory answer. Brother, we shall. Yet leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She is the capital demand within our four ranks of our articles. She hath good leave. Fair Catherine, and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier terms such as will enter at a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her beautiful heart? 
Your Majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. Oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Pardonnez-moi, I, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. Que dit-il que je suis semblable à les anges? Oui, vraiment, ainsi dit-il. Oh, bon Dieu, les langues des hommes semblent d'être trompées. Oui. <laughs> what says she, fair one? That the tongues of men are full of deceits? Uh, oui. <coughs> That the tongues of the men's is be full of deceits. That is the princess. In faith, Kate, my wooing is fit for thy understanding. I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say, I love you. Then if you urge me further to say, do you in faith, I wear out my suit. Give me your answer, in faith, do. And so clap hands and a bargain. How say you, lady? Sauveteaner, me understand well. Mary, if you would have put me to verses or to dance for your sake, Kate, why, do you undid me? If I could win a lady at leapfrog, or by vaulting into my saddle with my armor on my back, I should quickly leap into a wife. I could lay on like a butcher and sit like a jackanapes, but God before, Kate, I cannot look greenly nor gasp out my eloquence, nor I have no cunning in protestation. If thou canst love a fellow of this temper, Kate, who never looks in his glass for love of anything he sees there, let thine eye be thy cook. I speak to thee, plain soldier. If thou canst love me for this, take me. If not, to say to thee that I shall die is true, but for thy love by the Lord, no, and, and yet, I love thee, too. A speaker is but a prater. A rhyme is but a ballad. A good leg will fall. A straight back will stoop. A black beard will turn white. A curled pate will grow bald. A fair face will wither. A full eye will wax hollow. But a good heart, Kate, is the sun and the moon, or rather, the sun and not the moon, for it shines bright and keeps its course truly. If thou would have such a one, take me. Take me, take a soldier, take a soldier, take a king. How sayest thou then to my love? Speak, fair and fairly, I pray thee. Is it possible that I said love the enemy of France? No, Kate. It is not possible you should love the enemy of France, but in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well that I will not part with a village of it. I will have it all mine. And Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France, and you are mine. I cannot tell what is that. <laughs> no, Kate. I will tell thee in French which I'm sure will hang upon my tongue like a new married wife about her husband's neck, hardly to be shook off. Je pense la possession de France et quand vous voyez la possession de moi. Donc votre France et vous êtes me. It's as easy for me, Kate, to conquer the kingdom as to speak more French. I shall never move thee in French unless it be to laugh at me. No, in faith, Kate, it's not. But dost thou understand this much English? Canst thou love me? I, I cannot tell. Can any of your neighbors tell, Kate? I'll ask them. By mine honor in true English, I love thee. By which honor I dare not swear thou lovest me, yet my blood begins to flatter me that thou dost. Therefore, tell me, wilt thou have me? 
Come, your answer in broken music, for thy voice is music and thy English broken. Therefore, Catherine, queen of all, wilt thou have me? That is as it so please the Roman Pair. Nay, it will please him well. Then it shall also content me. Upon that I kiss your hand and I call you my queen. Laissez, Monsignor, laissez, laissez, mon foi, je ne vous prends que vous baisez vos terres gondères, and by all the more d'une de vos terres, c'est que il en dit que terres. Excusez-moi, je vous supplie, je m'en prie, Seigneur. Then I will kiss your lips, Kate. Madame, Madame, Monsieur, le point by all the nose, il ne peut le coutume de France. Madame, my interpreter, what says she? Uh, 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 that it is not be the fashion for the ladies of France. I cannot tell what is base there on English. To kiss. Uh, Your Majesty entendre better que moi. It is not a fashion for the maids in France to kiss before they are married. Would you say? Uh, oui, vraiment. Oh, Kate. Nice customs curtsy to great kings. You and I cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion. We are the makers of manners, Kate. Therefore, patiently and yielding. <laughs> you have witchcraft in your lips, Kate. There is more eloquence in a sugar touch of them than in the tongues of the French council. And here comes your father. By God, your majesty, my royal cousin, teach you our princess English. I would have her learn, my fair cousin, how perfectly I love her. And that's good English. Shall Kate be my wife? So please you. I am content. So the maiden cities you talk of may wait on her. So the maid that stood in the way of my wish shall show me the way to my will. We have consented to all terms of reason. Is so, my lords of England? The king hath granted every article, his daughter first, and then in sequel all, according to their firm proposed natures. Thereupon, give me your daughter. Take her, fair son, and from her blood raise up issue to me that the contending kingdoms of France and England, whose very shores look pale with envy of each other's happiness, shall cease their hatred, and this dear conjunction plant neighborhood and Christian-like accord in their sweet bosoms, that never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. Amen. Now welcome, Kate, and bear me witness all that here I kiss her as my sovereign queen. God. The best maker of all marriages, combine your hearts in one, your realms in one. As man and wife being two are one in love, so be there twixt your kingdom such spousal that never shall ill office or fell jealousy, which troubles oft the bed of blessed marriage, thrust a paction between these kingdoms to make divorce of their incorporate league, that English may as French, French Englishmen, receive each other. God speak this. Amen. 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 Thus far, with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story in little room, confining mighty men, mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small, most greatly lived this star of England. Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden be achieved, and of it left his son, Imperial Lord.
Thank you.